So I've been trying to uh, do a video on thermodynamics for someone that sent me a private message asking about how I could explain it, um, or at least provide some methods for those of us um, who, who don't have the mathematical side of things, um, but can understand, you know, complex concepts. Um, and the reason that I've been failing is because it's such an abstract concept, and I've been feeling more uh, interested in, in concrete, embodied realities recently. And, uh, you know, thermodynamics is about energy, about uh, the motion of energy. And I think what it leaves out is uh, the motion of psychological and spiritual energy. And, um, you know, certainly a scientist would uh, protest that I'm using um, terms meant to describe physical processes uh, as metaphors to talk about metaphysical uh, concepts or processes. And I would, I would remind the, the scientists that uh, any talk of physical energy also must be done using metaphors, because after all, what is energy? And if we're going to actually um, take a scientific view of all of reality as a whole, we've got, well, two poles to account for. We've got the conscious interior experience of matter, and we've got the um, exterior motion, mechanical, seemingly mechanical motion of matter. Both of these are somehow intimately related, um, because if we expect our scientific knowledge to mean anything, we're saying that we're conscious entities knowing um, a world. And so the world which is known, which we say is made up of energy, requires the internal energy which knows it in order to be that. And so we, we can't account for the whole cosmos in terms of thermodynamics. Um, as interesting as it is to try, and I've certainly had um, fun attempting to uh, at least incorporate thermodynamics into my larger uh, worldview on cosmology, um, but I'm more interested recently about human energy, um, about how we relate to one another, about how our consciousness is shared um, between and amongst ourselves because we, we typically think of, of the mind as an isolated entity existing in the skull that uh, you know each one of us has one of these minds that's entirely separate from everybody else's and that the only way energy or information can be exchanged between them is through some sort of physical medium, whether it's speech or written communication or music. Um, but of course, we, we all know that there's more ways of exchanging information um, than just through a physical medium. I mean, there's touch, first of all. And, you know, you could still argue that that's still informational exchange through a physical medium. I mean, there's just nerve cells in the skin which relay information to the neurons in the brain. You know, um, interpreting whatever it is that we feel with our extended senses. But um, really, we, to say it, to put it that way, we, we still haven't accounted for why we should feel anything. Um, to talk of what the body does as it senses and perceives and intuits its world in terms of some sort of information processing um, is to forget that the body is always already embedded in a world and that it has evolved out of and with this world. Um, and, you know, this includes individual members of a species um, of an ecosystem. They've all developed in concert um, and so are somehow internally related to one another. Um, and I think to think of what our mind is as some sort of information processor taking input 
in from a, a pre-given environment and then somehow turning it into our subjective, private experience such that we can then respond with an output. Um, I think that, that confuses the matter about uh, how embedded we actually are in this world and that there is no divide between who I am and who anybody else is or what anything else is. Um, though this whole dualism we've, we've constructed where we see the physical world as somehow separate and distinct from the spiritual world, where we think the outside world of the senses is somehow existing apart from the inside world of, of emotion and, and, you know, psychology and love and meaning and purpose, um, somehow they have to be related. And I think when we consider the, the, the path that our cosmos has, has taken over the last 13.7 billion years, and we try to account for it in terms of something like thermodynamics, we find that there must be a missing principle here. Because if all energy is conserved, as the first law of thermodynamics says, and um, an entropy, as the second law says, is um, more probable than neg entropy, then it's, it becomes very difficult to account for the obvious change over time uh, towards complexity, which we've seen in our cosmos. Um, and of course, not only has there been more, there been more complexity, but there's been more consciousness co coinciding with this complexity. Um, the laws of thermodynamics don't help us understand this. Um, you know, people like Ilya Prigozhin have have understood how life um, doesn't disobey the laws of thermodynamics, but we can no longer explain how life has emerged from a physical universe. Um, you know, it, it arises to dissipate gradients, we could put it that way. Um, you know, as I've said in so many of my other videos now, the, the gradient between the sun, the temperature of the light from the sun, and deep space, and the tremendous amount of free energy this produces at the surface of the planet for life to exploit and attempt to dissipate. Um, you know, this is a possible... Um, somewhat of a, a possible explanation for how life emerges, but it still doesn't account for it. It just shows how it's possible. Um, and so I, I think that once we've fully explored um, thermodynamics as an attempt to explain the development of our cosmos, and thermodynamics is more significant, I think, than um, any other field of, of physics, because it, it is the only... Uh, theory wherein time or the direction of time actually matters. In relativity and quantum theories, you can reverse time. It's They're time symmetrical. Whereas thermodynamics shows us that no, there are irreversible tendencies that uh, energy um, displays that uh, only move in one direction um, from the past into the future. And so it's sort of is the beginning of an understanding of, of the fact that um, our abstract equations cannot give us a perfect and complete understanding of, of a material world um, because we don't live in a material world or a place of some kind. We live in a process of development. Um, the universe is an event, in other words, rather than a place, or at least space and time are so um, intermingled that uh, we need to reconceive of our understanding of, of both as separate entities, which we so often um, conceive of them as. You know, space is a series of, of places, right? And time is the sequence in which those simultaneous places, given at any particular instant, um, continue to stack on top of one another. That I think is a, a false conceptualization of space and time um, that also separates the individual material entities which exist within space and time, like, like our bodies. Um, somehow we're all internally related as I was trying to describe earlier and that 
internal relation is a kind of collective consciousness where our psychological energies are shared without having to pass through a physical medium of some kind. Um, so, you know, I began this video in an attempt to escape the abstraction of, uh, the abstractions of thermodynamics, and I think I've certainly just created many more abstractions, but hopefully uh, they generated some type of uh, an understanding or resonance within you, and uh, if so, shoot me back some of your thoughts, uh, or just uh, telepathically uh, bring them to my awareness, I suppose.